presidential candidate, it's my honor to introduce Cynthia McKinney. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I have to apologize for um, being a bit tardy here, but let me just uh, tell you that New York City is really big to me. I'm from Georgia, born and raised, and y'all have five Atlantas right here. So please pardon me if we get turned around, if MapQuest turns us around. Anyway, you got a wonderful film in store for you. What we haven't been told is the rest of the story on how the 2000 and the 2004 elections, presidential elections, were stolen from the people. What we haven't been told is how, in fact, after that theft became known and documented, that we also learned and saw that the Democrats, whose votes were given to them by the majority of people who cast their votes, unfortunately didn't fight for the victory that the people gave to them. And so, unlike other instances where we have been told that it was the Green Party that participated in our form of government, in our election process, is the result of having the Bush folks, Laura and George W., up in the White House. But we know that's not true. We know it's absolutely not true. And the reason we know that it's not true is because we know that the Republicans got together and orchestrated a means by which they could deny black people the right to vote. And then the, the, we also know that not only did they do that across the country, they did it in the battleground state of Florida and then again in Ohio. We have seen so many election issues come to the forefront. One of the things that we as a party have to stand for more than anything else is election integrity. And we have to make sure that when people go to cast their votes, that their votes are actually counted. It is unacceptable that six million people, one million of them black, would go to the polls and cast their votes and their votes not even be counted. We have to protect the integrity of our elections. That's what this film is about. It is a case study in election theft. We as a community, as a people, as a party, must say no more stolen fraudulent elections. <laughs> and then after that, we have to make sure that we have people who are willing to put themselves on the front line and run for office so that the government is not them. The government is rightly us, and it is reflective of our values and our priorities. And the last thing I'll say is this. It is absolutely unconscionable that we would spend $700 billion to the Pentagon the same Pentagon that admits that it lost $2.3 trillion, that it spent $20 billion so that it could balance its books to make the computers talk to each other. And after having spent $20 billion, the computers still don't talk to each other. And the United States government can't balance its books because the Pentagon refuses to initiate accounting procedures that allow us to know what happens to the money that's appropriated to it by the Congress. We need people who are willing to do the hard work of oversight, oversight of the Department of Homeland Security, oversight of the Pentagon, oversight of every tax dollar that we give to the federal government. And then the last thing I'll say is this. We are in, I, am now in New York City. People in New York City deserve to know what happened on September 11th. We deserve, 
a real investigation? Because we have not had a real investigation. And how can we be sure that it won't happen again if we don't know how after spending trillions of dollars in a military and an intelligence infrastructure, it fails four times on one day? The people have a responsibility to get to the truth. And the only way it seems that we'll be able to get to the truth is to press for impeachment. Now, I don't know. I don't know why Nancy Pelosi would take impeachment off the table, but she leaves nuclear energy on the table. If we're going to do anything, let's take all nuclear power, nuclear weapons off the table. And one of the things we need to do, we've got to decommission our nuclear weapons. Why do we have our nuclear weapons on trigger? I certainly don't want George Bush with his finger on the button. And honestly, I don't want any of the other folks who might come after George Bush if it's not a member of the Green Party, of the party with a platform for peace on, with their finger on the button either. So um, I'll stop talking now because I hope that the film is loaded into the DVD machine. <laughs> is it? OK. Happy viewing. Well, did y'all like the film? Hey, all right. That's wonderful. I think it's wonderful for uh, if someone could get rid of the, the feedback. I think this film should be in every school because our students need to understand how we won the vote, the preciousness of the vote, and how easily we can lose it. So, questions? Well, the thing that I um, think we all can um, understand fairly easily is that the government failed to protect us. The Bush administration failed in its primary objective to protect the American people. And then they lied about it. And they covered it up. And they're still covering up. As to just exactly what happened on that day, that's for the academicians, the scholars, the, the sec national security whistleblowers. And we have quite a few of them who have done the research and understand uh, they are the experts who can tell us what they think happened in each specific instance. But the one thing that we can rest assured of is that the government failed the American people on that day. Um, first of all, I think it's very important to state for the record that election theft didn't start with the inauguration of electronic voting machines. And unfortunately, election theft through um, uh, trying to depress in every way possible the minority vote, as you saw in the part of the film that goes back into the history of the Voting Rights Act and the, and th the way the Voting Rights Act came to pass. Um, we have had an imperfect democracy, imperfect republic, um, for a very long time since actually the inception of this country. So. Um, efforts on the part of Republicans that we know about to depress the black turnout in many ways, well, gosh, I shouldn't get into this, but, well, maybe I won't. But, you know, it's sort of bipartisan because what happens is in the redistricting process, and you guys have application of the Voting Rights Act in some parts of New York State. You have it right here in New York City. And it's because New York City has a proven history of the, uh, of attempts to, of attempts to deny minorities access to the ballot. Now, um, so that's, I don't know if this is, this is probably worse. But um, so that's why I said in the film that for progressives, 
their number one issue in terms of making sure that progressive values are reflected by those who are elected to office is to protect the right to vote of blacks and minorities because we are going to make sure that civil liberties are protected, that social justice is enacted, and in the process, I know that those are your values too, those are our shared values. So that's one thing. Now, um, so the idea that we've got active efforts to suppress the black vote, to crack the black vote, to split the black vote, um, these are terms that are generally used in the redistricting process. All of these things happen, but they are efforts to fragment out so that blacks are denied, as Dr. King said, the Negro in Mississippi has to fight for the right to vote, but the Negro in New York has to have a reason for which to vote. And so it is representation is the reason that we all vote. What I learned during the time that I represented this district that first lifted me up with the people, the voters first lifted me up on their shoulders and sent me to Washington, which was a district that took in the outskirts of Atlanta, went over to uh, the city of Augusta, down the Savannah River and down to the city of Savannah, and took in 22 counties of the rural Black Belt where people paid their rent every month but they didn't have running water in their homes. And never did they ever expect that someone would walk their dirt roads with them and then go up and take their hopes and dreams and aspirations up to Washington. And that's what we were able to do. The unfortunate thing, though, is that the um, powers that be on both sides of the aisle didn't want them to have representation. And so then we learned very quickly that there's a difference between going to the polls and voting and getting a representative. There's a difference in having representation. And that's what now I think people are afraid of, is that the system has become so corrupted and so distanced from the will of the people, the values of the people, that now even you suffer from the lack of representation. Well, first of all, the Democratic majority in the Congress should have passed an electronic voting machine bill that required a paper ballot so that it could be counted. That was the first thing that should have happened, but that didn't happen. And so um, now what you have to hope, I don't know the type of machine that is used in Pennsylvania, but I can tell you, as you probably are aware, the state of Georgia was the very first state in our country. We're usually last in many things. We were first in the deployment of these Diebold touchscreen machines. And they proved to be an absolute disaster. Can you imagine? It's 99 degrees in the summertime in Georgia with 90% humidity and the machines break down and Diebold tells us that uh, we're sorry, they don't work in the heat. <laughs> That's really what they told us. So if Pennsylvania has the, uh, is in the unfortunate situation of using particularly the Dibo touchscreen machine, I can tell you that we have a lawsuit in the state of Georgia over my 2006 election because people from all over metropolitan Atlanta, we've got affidavits from voters not inside the geography of the fourth congressional district that I represented, but they voted in the fourth district race because that was the race that came up on their electronic voting machines. And when the people went to court, the expert witness said, you have to trust us. That's what the expert witness said, except that 
They, the courts have ruled now at the district court level and at the appellate level that the election results belong to Diebold. They don't belong to us. Um, well, in the first place, I mean, you know, after the kind of treatment that I've received in the corporate media, after the kind of targeting that um, I've had to live with, after the attacks on my physical person um, that even come to my home, the security threats, um, I have to wonder why. But I guess you could say that I am very much like you. I, I love this country. And I think that the power of this country is what is in its potential and what we can do for each other and what we can do for the world. And we're not living up to that potential. And so um, in an effort to try and understand even what my motivations were in the face of what has happened to me, I'm a student of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program. And um, so I reread the transcript from the December 1999 trial where Bill Schaap made his presentation about the government's use of the media. And um, unfortunately, the government has been able to use its assets in the media to distort and lie to the American public. And for the last five years of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life, we all revere him today, and we celebrate his life, but we forget about the details of that life. We forget that he was denigrated by the newspapers that we look up to today. The New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the New Orleans Times-Picayune, the Atlanta Constitution, were all a part of a network of newspapers that lied on Dr. King and did everything in it within their power to sully his reputation, to destroy his reputation, to destroy his organization, and to try and destroy his effectiveness in the movement. Now that's a fact. And so we have to understand that it's, it's a very short distance between what happened with Dr. King and the fact that we've got CIA PSYOPs agents in CNN's newsroom. So then what does that mean in terms of me being, you know, willing to put myself on the front line? I can't tell you why, other than that I come from real good stock. I come from strong stock. I come from the kind of stock like Malcolm X, who the federal government wanted him dead, and they wrote about it. They visited him, and they told him that. And on the morning of his murder, he received a phone call. And that phone call, as the story is told in the book, The Assassinations by Jim DiEugenio, that that phone call was from FBI agents who said, today is the day. Now, Malcolm X could have told his wife to pack the bags, gather the children, and we're going back to Georgia. But he didn't do that. Malcolm X told his wife to get the children dressed. We have an appointment. Malcolm X showed up at the Audubon Ballroom, and we all now know that Malcolm X was murdered. So now, what is it after knowing that after knowing that the CIA wrote a document dated May 11th, 1965, three years before the murder of Dr. King, that they said somewhere at the top there must be a Negro who is clean who could step into the vacuum in chaos once Dr. King is either exposed or assassinated. This was a written prescription for regime change on black America. So after knowing all of that, how can I dare say that I'm scared that I'm afraid, that I can't do it. Rosa Parks couldn't get a job in Alabama 
And so she had to leave Alabama after she sat down on that bus. Her sitting down that we celebrate today came at great personal expense to her. But she did it, and she withstood it. She ended up in Michigan because that's where she could get a job, in the office of John Conyers. Um, very good question. First thing I would do is I would send no more weapons at all to any of the parties. I would press for the declaration of a nuclear free zone. And of course, then we have to set the example if we ask other countries to um, um, disable their nuclear weapons and dismantle them, then we also have to do the same. And um, then I would listen to all of the sides that are there. And I would have an open mind because while we've been told that the two-state solution is the solution, well, there are human rights activists inside Israel who think that a one-state solution might be the solution. And so really we ought to put everything on the table. And the people who live in the region are the people who have to decide what kind of future they want. We utilize our resources to assist in that. And so when people vote their hopes and dreams and aspirations, we recognize that. We step out of the way and let people talk to each other. That's just the beginning. Secondly, I would declare a Department of Peace instead of the Department of State. I would utilize the apparatus of the Department of State, name it the Department of Peace, and then uh, fund it adequately so the diplomacy could be the tool that we use to send our, our wealth of resources, not just our money, but our technology and our brains and our human capital, um, send the, our best and brightest out into the world to help people. Oh, okay, okay. Um, you have really been a great audience uh, being here and watching this powerful film and listening to Cynthia and talking with Cynthia. We know she has to get going in a few minutes, but you know, her passion, her commitment, her courage really came through. I was really moved by this. And what people have to understand is even though we all agree with the principles and we want to get out there and work for Cynthia, that the corporations pretty much are pouring billions of dollars into those candidates that will do what they want them to do, not right. what we need to be done, not give health care to 47 million uninsured, not right. feed 14 million starving children, not bring our troops home, not save this planet, which is headed toward disaster very soon. So what we have to do is say the Green Party takes no corporate money. It's about us in this room, students, retired people, teachers, union workers. You must be able to fund this campaign so that we can show not only California that we raise more money than them, but that we can get yeah. Cynthia as into the debates out there and Absolutely. publicize as much as possible. You can donate up to $2,300, but at least 250 of your money will go directly for matching funds. Here's my check. Anybody else, please, can you match this? That's what we really need you to do, another $250. Anybody here can do that. It would really be appreciated. Donate, bring that form back. We are taking Cynthia all the way to the White House. Thank you for coming here, Cynthia. It was wonderful to have you here. I just want to say thank you to those of you who uh, make a contribution, and I hope everyone would. Because let me tell you, um, it's not easy putting up with the stuff that I put up with. And of course, we don't need to match what they do because we really have the people on our side, but we just need enough to do what we, what we need to do. We've already visited 22 states. We've got a few more states we need to get to because we're going to go into every one of our states. We're taking this message of hope and real change. Angela Davis made a statement the other day. She said, we don't want a campaign that promises change but gives us no change. <laughs> Mumia said it best when he said, if you vote for Cynthia McKinney, you get real change. So please, help us. Is there a number we can give people? Um, actually, what you can do is you can go to the website 
And under volunteer, you can click on volunteer. The website is runcynthiarun.org. And you can click on volunteer. And what we've done now, we've been able to put a database together of everyone by state. And then once we get the state coordinators, which are probably these women in this room and these women wonderful, um, then we will connect the volunteers with the leadership.